viewers of this channel who have seen my earlier video on the Heathkit model IM-102 digital multimeter, which was their very first digital multimeter offering, know that in that video I talked about the progenitor of this meter, which was the Weston model 1240. Both Heathkit and Weston were owned by Schlumberger in those days, and indeed the Weston 1240 was also produced as the Schlumberger 1240. And because Heathkit was under the same parent company, under the same corporate umbrella, if you will, they were apparently given access to and rights to produce versions of the Weston product, and that became their IM-102. It was a surprisingly professional design for Heathkit, which usually catered to a more of a middle road or a high-end base user clientele. Good products, but never as sophisticated or as refined as the, uh, the higher-end professional products. And in the case of the IM-102, it did seem a lot more professional than what they were otherwise offering, and I think the reason is that they had the 1240 as a basis for the design. So this video will be about my experiences with the 1240 and what I can share about them. All right, here's uh, the second of the two 1240s I have. Both of these are eBay purchases. This one is in better condition internally. And if I pan over here, I've got this discombobulated one. where the front of the case I think is in better condition than the other one. This is actually the first one I bought. This circuit has a lot of damage to it. Somebody's gone in and removed parts and put other parts in that probably aren't the right values and there's areas that look physically damaged and it's kind of a mess. Um, it certainly does not work. Um, but its case, other than being really blotchy and so on, doesn't really have any cracks on it. Well, not many. It has a little cracking here. And that tab is, well, it's not entirely missing. It has the the detent there. Um, I think otherwise it's in good condition. I think this one will clean up cosmetically better than the other one. On the other hand, it's got some issues like this. And there's a lot of corrosion in here. My plan is to try to clean up this case and use it um, along with the guts of this one and also try to use this front panel. It also has um, less yellowing. The, the buttons are less yellowed and more even colored. So that's... it also has uh, plated jacks. Whereas this one just has like brass colored jacks which isn't bad I just prefer the shinier color there's a lot of discoloration on this one two pieces busted out of it and I would probably say the the rest of the case is okay but the uh, the color is way off I think it's spent a lot of time in the sunlight and it has some pretty substantial cracks in it both cases are missing their handles. The recommended disassembly procedure involves first removing the bezel and there's these little screwdriver slots. The way it's supposed to be done is to provide a... you're not supposed to go in and twist the screwdriver to pry it. It inevitably gouges the plastic a little bit. In reality the metal handle can be folded into the up position where it goes around like this and it has a slot on it 
into which you stick the screwdriver and then go into the slot here and then pry against the hole in the metal handle and use that as the um, <clears throat> the pivot point for the lever and then that forces this out and it snaps to a point about an eighth of an inch further on at that point then you're supposed to stick the screwdriver in behind the bezel still using the the slot in the handle as a fulcrum and then pry it the rest of the way out. Well I don't have that so I'm gonna have to do it the hard way. Alright I've made a, a little aluminum bracket that resembles the important parts of the side handle for the purpose of prying the the bezel off of the case. Okay there's my little prying bracket offset on a couple of washers and now I should be able to put the screwdriver in there and just pry and that worked good so now that that's that way I should be able to then put the screwdriver under the back of it and pry a little further like that on both sides to get it out Okay, so now we just gently pry this front a little further away. It takes the uh, switch shaft with it, which passes through all the the uh, layers of the uh, range switch. Sometimes the shaft sticks with the switch, sometimes it sticks with the knob. Either case, it can be removed and stuck back in. Yeah, I was able to break it free and return it. Need a little wiggling to get it all the way back in there. So we... Uh, have it like this and at this point all these cables are supposed to come off with little quick connects okay now those have come off you can um, just about see the little uh, push connects on some of them for the um, ones that look like this and then just these um, round parts here are what these guys go on to. There is two shielded cables and also a discrete white wire. The discrete white wire, which I've marked with a double horizontal dash goes on to onto here that's the the milliamps jack the other one which I've marked with a vertical dash goes on to here there's a fuse inside of here and a fuse inside of here this fuse is for the ohms function even though this jack is for volts and ohms and there's a fuse inside of here and that's for the current mode and these tabs down here go to the front of the fuse holder and these go to the rear of the fuse holder and there's spring it's kinda hard to see but they're spring loaded uh, because of the spring action of the fuse holder in here so when you have a fuse in here and you put one wire here it's on the side of the um, fuse that's towards the front and when you put a wire here it's on the side of the fuse that's opposite the front so this is the fused point and this is the unfused point in the case of the ground connection only the front one is used there's no fuse in here uh, so the volt a wire goes to here for measuring volts because that does not go through a fuse it just relies on the high impedance circuit to prevent 
excessive uh, current. And then this is the fused side and that's used for the ohms. This is used for ground as is its flip side. They're both the same electrical point so the shields of the two shielded cables go here and here. And then uh, the wire that goes here and that's for the current again. And that's the individual wire. Whenever these panels are removed from the case you have to watch these metal fingers. Those are critical and easily banged up um, doing various things. Uh, so especially when pulling this out from the case or trying to wrestle these wires off of here because they fit pretty tight you don't want to have your hand suddenly slip and prang into these and mess it up. So those have to be protected at all costs. Now um, I have to see about walking this guy back in a little bit. There we go. Pushed it back in. Now we have to get the circuit board out of the case. Oh, another thing. <laughs> There's this um, thing there that they call the uh, tube clamp. It's a black plastic piece and it runs into slots there and there and it has tabs that sit on top of the tubes keeping them from coming out of their sockets and also well here's another one that I've already pulled out of the other guy so these horizontal tabs sit on top of the tube next to the, to the nipple there and then these more or less vertical pieces lightly touch the back of the tubes. And those are important. Um, they also have some effect in um, acting as a light shield so that you don't look straight through the tube and see uh, components inside. There are also these other two little things on the back which are like mystery things but they are explained in the manual. This is set up so it can be mounted in a panel instead of um, just being freestanding. You still use the case. It's necessary for the AC power cord to go in there so uh, or the AC power cord connection is actually physically part of the case and for it to dock with the circuit board you need this to be there even if you panel mount it you can make a cutout and use these screws in the corners to mount this to a panel and then snap the bezel back on the front but when you do that now um, the back of the circuit board is offset a little bit from where it needs to be so it needs to be brought forward and what you do is you break these off of here they're just on very narrow little pieces of plastic. You break those off and you stick these on the backs of the circuit board like little clips and then those offset the circuit board so they don't so it doesn't go back quite so far and therefore it compensates for the expected thickness of the panel you're mounting this into and everything here is moved forward by approximately that thickness. So that's what these little things are for and they just have it on there as a way to store them in case they're needed. But when you pull this whole assembly out of the case that piece is going to fall off so you you want to pay attention to that. To release the circuit board assembly from the case there are these two screws here and here and these don't actually screw into anything on the circuit board. The screw that protrudes beyond that has a little tab on it that rotates so when you turn the screw about a half or a half a rotation uh, counterclockwise the little tabs that are you have to picture the circuit board as being right about here and there's little slots in the circuit board and when you turn this counterclockwise the little tab rotates out of the slot in the circuit board and comes down to here and you do the same thing with this guy and then there's nothing holding the circuit board into the case except for spring tension on the three spring clips which engage the other side of the power cord socket pins. Okay the screws have been rotated half a turn 
counterclockwise, and let's see if the board will come out. Now that tab has been moved horizontally. It's a little stiff at first because again those three spring clips for the uh, power socket um, are a little tight until you get them out of there. This little piece pops out now. It's this circuit board, the daughter board, pushes it out of the clips in the case, such as that one right there and the one over here. So it just falls out. So it's important to remember its orientation so it can be put back in when inserting the board back into the case. And it's out. So there's the uh, locking tab folded down and the other locking tab folded down. The holes for the calibration pots the three pins for the power cord socket that's integral to the case and the slot for the uh, auxiliary um, edge card connector that sticks out and also the uh, voltage setting switch that goes through that slot. This is a very heavy case. I believe it's made out of Lexan. Weston instruments of this vintage were supposedly made from molded Lexan for ruggedness, and I can believe it, but that doesn't mean that they can't be broken. So the um, the three pins of the um, power socket go here, here, and back here underneath this cord. This one's set way back because the fuse holder for the hot lead is in this position. So that's the hot, this is the uh, neutral, and this is the ground. Now because there's no chassis and no metal case, the ground connection only goes to the core of the transformer. It goes nowhere else. Let's just take a quick view of the circuit board from different angles. And there's the bottom. The three sets of leads for the front panel jacks come out through this hole. You've got the one shielded cable, the other shielded cable, and the individual lead. And they just lay underneath the board. Now this one seems to have had some damage at some point. Something got blown off the board and somebody's gone in and fixed it. Looks like the um, voltage regulator chip probably cooked off at some point and took out the related components. This double-sided edge connector, 10 pins on each side, is for the um, auxiliary battery pack option. But it's not just a battery pack. Um, by reverse engineering the circuit of this previously um, on the first meter I had. Uh, they really don't do very much with the existing power supply in here at all. 
Instead they feed the AC power right out here and it apparently it has its own power supply in the battery pack and it has the battery pack and then running off of that is additional circuitry to generate the necessary voltages that the rest of the meter needs so it's not just a battery pack it's got an AC input it has the battery charging circuitry it has the battery itself and then it has circuitry to convert the battery power to the necessary voltages that the rest of the the meter runs on it's a weird way of doing it I'm sure that made it much more expensive um, but that's the way they're doing it and anyway a number of these pins have line voltage on them or voltages that are high enough to possibly cause a problem now Weston provided this thing that's like a a plastic tube that's been cut with a saw and then that's jammed over the edge connector to protect the pins and keep people from inadvertently touching them uh, that's all well and good although these things depolymerize and leave an awful sticky mess on the connectors which I've cleaned off here um, but I can see somebody's taken a saw to this on the top side only and cut through I suppose at some point somebody did not have this thing on it and was worried that something would come in contact with the tops of these protruding pins short something out and so they just said well we're not using that function let's cut it so none of these top side pins are actually uh, electrically connected all right let's do a tour of the circuit board so we start out with the power transformer and the switch to select between 115 and 230 volts there is no power fuse on the circuit board like I've already mentioned it's integral to the power cord socket that's molded into the case so there is a fuse that's just not on the board uh, there are various diodes scattered around here for different parts of the power supply here 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 uh, over here and uh, those develop a high voltage supply for the Nixie tubes a 3.6 volt regulated supply for the logic ICs that are over here these are all logic ICs they're all RTL type so they run at either 3.5 or 3.6 volts somewhere in that ballpark and there's also a plus and minus 12 volt supply um, which is done by splitting a higher voltage supply in half with zeners and then grounding the middle of it uh, so these two electrolytics here uh, one of them is for the 3.5 or 3.6 volt supply and the other one is for the the uh, analog power supply that's developed as a single supply and then split in half as I mentioned with two zeners for plus and minus so it only needs two electrolytics and indeed there's only three electrolytics on this entire meter and the third one is this guy down here and this is um, also used in the same circuit that uh, develops the 3.6 volt supply it's the uh, post regulator stabilization capacitor I don't know why it's way over there next to the transformer but that's where it is and then um, the high voltage supply is actually done using well its own winding of the transformer but just a diode and a capacitor and um, probably it's this diode here because it's the only one of its kind I suppose it could be this one but it's probably this is probably a zener I think it's this diode and then this capacitor I believe are the ones that develop the high voltage supply and uh, let's see okay so 
This is the daughter board here that handles the AC to DC conversion. So on AC volts or AC milliamps, the inputs get wired directly to this board. Actually, they go to the main board and then they go through these connectors you can see here, and there's some more over there to get power and signals in and out. And uh, a couple gangs of the switch, the first two gangs get connected to this board, whereas the rest of the gangs of the range switch get connected to the main board. So this board even has its own gangs of the range switch. It doesn't use the other ones. And uh, it has its own attenuators, its own uh, compensating capacitors, and uh, then it has an FET here that provides a high impedance buffer, high impedance to low impedance, and another transistor that goes with it. And then the result of that is a scaled AC signal. And then that gets applied to this op amp here, which along with a couple of diodes that are down here somewhere, oh, up here, these two diodes, those form a precision rectifier or precision active rectifier circuit that converts the uh, AC to DC and then that's used by the rest of the circuit just as if it was a normal input that was DC from the start and there's a number of other capacitors these little black ones here are I believe tantalum capacitors they're polarized capacitors but they're not electrolytics um, so I don't know if they're tantalum in a square package usually they're more like a uh, a rounded package for tantalums but these may be just molded into that style of case this is the um, AC calibration potentiometer and then there are the two um, AC compensation trim capacitors and that's what's on that board for um, DC volts and ohms, they both use the same precision hybrid resistor divider package, and that's what's in this black box. So several precision resistors are all potted into this thing, and depending on the switching, they get used again by the ohms range and by the um, DC volts range. For the amps, Instead, there's a series of shunt resistors right here. The lowest one that's only a fraction of an ohm is actually a Kelvin type, so it has two leads on each end. Although they're, um, yeah, they, they are using them. It's just that one of them doesn't really go anywhere useful. <laughs> um, I think it may be this one here. Interesting on the Heathkit version of this, where they essentially copy the the circuit design they actually do use the Kelvin resistor in its full capacity uh, so you pass the current through one or more of these shunts and then develop a voltage drop across that and then you measure that with the uh, the regular meter circuit just as a voltage and again these this is the rest of the uh, the gangs or the wafers of the range switch. How about the function switch? Well we already know that it just uses these little um, tines when you push a particular switch on the front it raises these up and there's actually um, six prongs on there, or six tines, and they form three gangs of a switch. So the first two are connected together, the next two are connected together, and the last two are connected together, but they're not interconnected. And likewise, when you push another switch, that one comes up, and likewise. Now those make contact with these gold-plated pads on the bottom of the circuit board because the switches are underneath and they swing up and make contact there. 
So that's how the function switch connections are made. These two big resistors down here are, um, they're not uh, attenuators, they're coupling or isolation resistors. And that's because this meter circuit uses a philosophy where the analog to digital converter is either in a 0 to 0.2 volt range or a 0 to 2 volt range. It's expecting one or the other. And so the scaling circuit has to take whatever inputs you've got and knock it down to one of those two ranges. And uh, then also some switching in here tells the A to D converter which range it needs to be in according to how the scaling is reducing the input voltage. But what if you have a 0 to 0.2 volt or 0 to 200 millivolt input? There's actually a range for that then you don't need any scaling and there's no need to run anything through the resistor attenuator instead it just bypasses all of that and goes through one of those big gray resistors straight into the analog to digital converter and by the same token um, something else does the same trick uh, so when you're in the mode oh, I was, I was going to say that so the 0 or 0 to 0 0.2 range and the 0 to 2 range, both of them on this switch, both of those need to bypass the resistor ladder in this attenuator block. And that may be what the other one's for. I'd have to check the schematic again. And then um, there's a trim pot over here. I believe this is the one for... No, I'm not sure. I'd have to check my diagram again. Uh, so there's one trim pot there. This is a trim capacitor for calibrating the master oscillator. There's a trim potentiometer here for adjusting the 3.6 volt supply to get it right where it should be. And uh, there's already the one up here that I already mentioned that's for calibrating the AC uh, conversion functionality. Then we have the four additional trim pots that are accessible through the rear. Those are the ones that are expected to be adjusted once it leaves the factory. These other ones you probably never touch during the whole life of the instrument. There are three op amps in here, one, two, three. And these are the old round can style. And one of them is in a socket. One of these is part of the uh, precision current source for the Ohm's function. Another one is the comparator for the analog to digital integration and comparison circuit and probably this one I'm guessing is the uh, the op amp for the uh, dual slope integrator and I figure that without checking the documentation again because this capacitor is the integrating capacitor you'd want it to be close to the op amp. The uh, integrator circuit uh, charges and discharges this capacitor at a linear rate and it also at times in the cycle needs to be provided with an external precision constant current source or constant current sink. And um, these components around here including these two packages here uh, are part of that circuit. These are actual dual transistor packages, two identical transistors in one package, and these are the same. One of these is their PNPs, the other one's NPNs. So one's in the source and one's in the sync circuit. And then kind of matched components. There's a regular transistor that goes at this one, regular transistor goes at this one. Those are the transistors that are used by logic to turn the circuits that go with these on and off. Pretty much this whole string of components and these are part of those precision constant current source and sinks. And then we're already back into the power supply. The uh, 3.6 volt series pass transistor is this one. That's why I got this big weird looking uh, heat sink on it. 
then the logic that con controls the whole analog to digital conversion, it's all discrete in the sense that it's not a big monolithic um, converter IC. These are just gates, you know, um, AND gates, OR gates, that type of thing in here. And they're all RTL, as I said before. So six chips like that control the whole functionality of the instrument. Then we have these nine chips that are here. Those are all, again, RTL, but they're part of a set that goes together. They are uh, counters and latches and BCD to Nixie tube driver chips. Again, it's part of a matched set that was intended to do exactly this job in any number of instruments from frequency counters to um, analog display meters with Nixie tube displays. Um, they were manufactured for that express purpose. They have no extra features on them. They just do that one thing. Uh, and you can pack them in pretty close. Even the pinouts are arranged for easy foil passage between them in a small area to fan out and go to the, the Nixie tubes. And then we have the Nixie tubes in the front. This is a three and a half digit meter, so it can count up to 1999. The 999 is done with three Nixie tubes. And the one is just done with a very tall, regular neon bulb, the element of which is approximately the same height as the characters in the Nixie tubes. So that's how you get the one in the thousands position, then hundreds, tens, and units. Oh, this is the zero trim pot, which is accessible through a hole in the front panel. And then this is a block that holds three additional neon bulbs, but ones that face forwards and are designed to have the light come out the end instead of the side. And those are used for um, one that's behind this white part gives you an overrange indicator that appears about here. This is sort of a diffuser screen. And then there are two more neon bulbs, one above another, one here and one here. And this one has a plus symbol on it. This one has a minus symbol. So it tells you, because this meter is auto polarity, so if you've got a positive signal coming in, you'll get a plus sign lights up. If you get a negative signal, you get a minus sign light up down there. And then there's um, four transistors here that are used to control the four neon bulbs. This one that's used for the thousands position and the three of them that are inside this housing. And then there's a number of um, additional discrete components around those. And they kind of squeeze some of them down here underneath as well. It's all pretty tight. Not a lot of extra room in here. All right, I've got the case that I'm using sitting in a warm, soapy bath. Loosen up some of the gunk on it. All right, I have this bezel cleaned up as much as I can get it. It's pretty filthy. This is the one that does not have any cracks on it, and the buttons are the whitest. It looks like the window actually is supposed to snap into grooves along the top and the bottom. <clears throat> and indeed, the window I have is bowed a little bit, as if it had spent a long time being sprung into something like that. Um, but it also had adhesive on the back. I don't know if somebody added that later or if it was there from the get-go. My experience with most of these Weston meters is that all the faceplate parts, windows, are designed to snap out for uh, cleaning or replacement. So it may have been that they were originally intended to just snap in there. I don't think the window I have will snap in anymore, not without assistance from adhesive. 
And this is just one of the fuses. These are the short ones that I believe are about one inch long. Where's my ruler? Yeah, so one inch long and a quarter inch in diameter. Called by various things, but it should be a quarter amp fast blow fuse. And that goes in the fuse holder that's part of the power cord receptacle that's built into the back of the case. And then it has the actual prong which holds on to the fuse to help you pull it out. So the fuse just snaps in there like that. And then it goes in like that and you screw it in. Now the grip on this thing is supposed to be accomplished in part by the uh, the knobs that go on the handles. Although it's not clear to me how they do that. I just grabbed it with a needle nose pliers and twisted it out. Okay, this case is cleaned up pretty nicely. Doesn't have the black blotches on it anymore. I've polished up those pins a little bit. Got it nice and cleaned out inside. I've changed out these two electrolytics. It's really hard to find ones anymore that are new that are in this form factor. I almost went with uh, radial lead caps instead of axials, but I decided to go this way. Okay, I'm putting the circuit board back into the case. And I get it up to about this point where the daughter board passes the... Um, we have to get past the point where the daughter board passes this... Um, ah, this plastic piece here. Like that. So these slots there and there are accessible. And then this piece has to get in there. Let's see. They don't make it easy. Kind of like that. And then just push the board the rest of the way in. And it should take that piece with it. And once it doesn't go in anymore, this black piece stops right at that uh, blue plastic protuberance. Won't go any further. So that's as far as the board can go in. And now I've got to go in there and get those locking tabs rolled into position. Okay, that one's in there. And that one's in there. This shaft slides in and out, but it only goes back as far as the other end hits the power transformer. So that's what limits how far that goes in. It needs to uh, stick out that much. Make sure all the Nixie tubes are in good position and in their sockets. Make sure all the switches are straight and in, oops, <laughs> straight and in the up position. And then the cover snaps on. Alright, let's see how this restoration worked out. 
I've got the meter plugged into power. I've got test leads in. I'll put it in DC volts ohms position and turn it on. Got a nice reading of zero. Go up to the two volt range. It's got a little bit of float on it. I'll turn the power supply on and it should go really close to zero. Let's take it up to one volt. And we've got one volt. Take it up to two and we get an over range indication. So I'll select it up to the 20 volt range. I've got a nice even two. We'll crank it up to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and we get an over range. Select it up to the 200 volt range, and we've got approximately 20 volts. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 6, 7, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. And that's the size my power supply can go. I'll switch up to the 1000 volt range, and I still get 32 volts just without the decimal point. Now if I, and I do have the plus indicator going there by the way, it's a little bit faint but it's on. Those, nix, or those uh, neon bulbs are probably a little bit dim at this point. They look better to the naked eye than they do on the camera though. Okay, I've reversed the leads and I've got the minus sign here. Okay, I've put the meter in the 20 milliamp position and switched it to DC milliamps. I've got the leads connected to the milliamp jack and the comm jack. And I've got 24 volts on my power supply and a loop milliamp loop tester in here. So I'll turn that on. And it goes to about 12 milliamps. And the pot here is in the center, so it should be about 12 milliamps. If I center it up a little bit better, I get a nice even 12. And that's right where it should be in the middle. If I throw the uh, switch to go to 4 milliamps, it goes right down to 4. If I throw the other switch to go up to 20 milliamps, it'll probably overrange, and it does, because it's just a hair too high. I'll go back to the knob, I'll turn it down, 4 milliamps, turn the knob up, go up almost all the way clockwise, and I get slightly over range. That's looking good. It is reading minus here for some reason. Don't know why it's doing that. All right, I've got the meter back on the voltage plug positions. I've got it selected to AC volts and I'm in the 200 volt range. I've got the test leads hooked up to my AC access panel and my variac. I'm gonna turn the variac on and then turn the access panel on and I will crank her up to somewhere around 50 volts and we got it I will crank it up to somewhere around 100 volts and we're getting it there go full scale it should be around 140 some odd volts and it is so AC volts is also working just fine Nice fast update speed on the display and the sampling. All right, I have the meter set up with the volt ohm and common leads going to my resistor decade box. I'm in DC volt ohms and I'm in the 200 ohm range and I'm reading about 0.1 ohm. If I crank this up to 2 ohms, I'm getting the same offset or the same quiescent plus 2 should be about 7, reading 7.1. 
let's go up to 20 ohms and we're getting that plus quiescent 50 80 let's go to 100 ohms if I go to 200 ohms it'll over range so I go to the 2k range and I'm reading 0.199k so yeah that's appropriate for 200 ohms let's go to 500 ohms just ever so slightly low 900 slightly over that's good let's go to 1k on the other knob really close go to 2k and it over ranges go to 20k here 1.99 is not bad uh, 4k 7k let's go to the 10k position I've got 10k there I can go to 15k let's go to 20k and it'll over range select the 200k position got 20.0 K, which is appropriate. Let's go to 60K, 60.65K, crank that back, go to 100K, and 170K, 200K, and we over range. I go to the 2 meg range and we're 0 0.2 megs which is 200 K 500 800 900 and if I turn all the others up these other ones don't count for much it's still only about one meg I can't really go any higher. I can go to the 20 meg range and see that it still reads 1 meg. So that's working just fine. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Let's go back one range. 0.5 megs at, uh, yep. Yeah. I've got all these other ones turned up, so I'm going to crank those down back to zero. It should be about 4.4 megs, which is 400K, which is what I've got dialed in. Take it down to 3, 2, 1, 0. And the ohms range is working perfectly. I get the little plus and minus dance sometimes, which is what you're supposed to get when the meter really thinks it is reading exactly 0. Okay, there's the beauty shot. getting a little reflection of the, or not reflection, I'm seeing a little bit of the top of the Nixie tubes through the filter. There used to be some masking in there, but it's gotten weaker over the years. I'm not too concerned about that. It's a nice looking meter. All right, let's take a look at the Weston 1240 Digital Multimeter Manual. This is one I bought on eBay, so it's an original. Um, I'm not impressed with it, even though the meter is pretty high class. The manual is kind of crap. You know, it's clearly some sort of xerographic reproduced process instead of a, uh, you know, lithographic process. And even the text goes at a slight angle. Well, this came out of somebody's calibration laboratory with a lot of dates and things on it. Some corporation that had some of these. Manual belongs to Data Mechanic. Data Mechanic? Data Mech? Data Ma? I don't know. Some phone numbers. Should call some of those and see what gets you there. Um, so, uh, dated 1969, so that dates this meter 
um, no later than 1969 itself. There's a nice picture of it with what looks like a simulated display because that does not really look like Nixie tubes there. They're all on the same plane there, too neatly formed. Uh, table of contents. Even though the presentation's kind of crappy, the manual itself, as far as text and illustrations, is not too bad. List of illustrations, general information. The Weston 12. 40 is a compact digital multimeter designed for maximum operator convenience and utility. Five voltage and five current ranges, both AC and DC, as well as six resistance ranges are self-contained in a high-impact resistant plastic case. Now, um, the material they use for the case on this seems to be two different kinds for the bezel and for the body of the case. Uh, the color and the consistency of the plastic seem to pretty much match some of the other Weston meters I have and also the corresponding Heathkit versions because they were both owned by the same company at the time, Weston and Heathkit, uh, and they had some cross-pollination. And my understanding is they use Lexan for a lot of the case bodies, so that's probably what the plastic is, the high-impact plastic case. The basic measuring circuit is a high impedance bipolar analog to digital converter which employs dual slope integration to achieve excellent accuracy and long term stability. The basic measurement ranges are 200 millivolts and 2 volts DC at an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1 percent of, of reading plus or minus 0.05 percent of full scale. Oh, so yeah, 0.1 percent of the reading plus or minus 0.05% of the full scale. All other ranges and functions are converted to one of these basic ranges for measurement as a DC voltage. A custom designed thin film attenuator extends DC voltage measurements to 1000 volts with a voltage coefficient of less than 100 parts per million at 1000 volts. Overrange capability permits useful readings of DC voltage to at least 50% beyond the inherent 2000 bits. Specifications. More specifications. More specification. Installation. It talks about the carrying handles, the tilt stand operation, which is for bench or tabletop use. The handles should be locked in the open position. Two stable orientations of the handles are possible, each providing a different height off the table. In one position, the inner, hand, inner handle is forward. In the second, it is to the rear. It is important that the detents on the handles be engaged when in the tilt stand position. But as far as I've been able to tell from the illustrations and the photos of people who have the stands still with theirs, I didn't see any detents on them. It's also panel mountable, meaning you can make a cutout in a panel of some sort and mount the body of the meter behind the cutout and the bezel on the front so there are allowances on the way this is built to allow it to be mounted in such a way and it tells you how to do it. Here's an illustration of the meter with its dual handle kickstand arrangement. You can swing them both forwards, you can swing one forward and one backwards, you can put them at different angles and it's a fairly clever arrangement. There's an illustration of that. So carrying position um, tilted down, like if you've got it on a shelf above you aiming down, or this way to tilt it up, or both of them going at an angle to just elevate it off the table a little bit for maybe a better viewing angle. And there's some illustrations for uh, the cutouts if you're going to panel mount it. Disassembly details. That's assuming you're going to use these illustrations for panel mounting. Power requirements, 150 volts AC or 230 volts AC, 50 hertz to 400 hertz. I'm not sure why it goes up to 400 hertz other than just that it can, but it's possible, I suppose, that they thought this might find use in um, military aviation, where I understand they use 400 hertz AC power on the aircraft. Maybe 
they made it work that high for that particular market, don't know. Front panel illustration and basic operation, what does what. Talks about input fuse protection, how to change the fuses. The nuts which are used, the star nuts which are used for um, the handles, like here. One of them comes off and has a tool on the end of it which allows engaging the fuse holders and unscrewing them from the front to get at the fuses. Actually all three positions for the test leads hold fuses. The middle one's a spare uh, and then the actual two fuses, one for the ohms range and one for the milliamps range, are inserted in the outer two positions. And there is no fuse for the voltage range, it doesn't need it. Then the rear uh, panel illustration, the 115 230 volt selector switch, the battery uh, accessory um, edge card connector, the built-in or integral uh, power cord socket which includes the power line fuse on the right hand pin. It unscrews similarly to the ones on the front except it doesn't use the hex nut arrangement. Um, then the major calibration pots poke through holes in the rear. Various instructions on how to use it in various ways. Several pages of that. And then a fairly nice theory of operation. They do a better job than the Heathkit manual, although it's very clear that the Heathkit manual for the IM-102, which is a circuit clone of this meter, as I've mentioned in my video on that subject, on the IM-102. Um, in many cases, they sort of slavishly copied almost word for word. In other cases, they went off on their own. And usually when Heathkit went off on their own in copying this manual, that's when they got kind of sloppy with it, I think, and they didn't do as good a job as the authors of this text. So anyway, theory of operation... Introduction, the DC voltmeter circuit, the dual slope analog to digital conversion process, throw a little bit of math at you, timing charts for the signals, the logic section of the DC voltmeter circuit, polarity display reference current control, zero crossing readout command. Unfortunately, the electrical or electronic schematic diagrams in this manual are pretty tiny. They really should have used a larger format. Um, they may have had some sort of a case that this meter would fit in. Maybe they deliberately sized the meter manual small so it could fit into a pocket in the case. That's only the good reason I can think of for making it so small. Uh, so this is a block diagram of the logic section. Helps explain it a little better than looking at the actual schematic. And then we continue, the, the diagrams are just wherever they fit, I guess, not in any particular order. Uh, getting it back into the circuit theory and a simplified diagram. That's of the basic um, integrator circuit. And then um, more of the integrator circuit reference current circuits, and then into the ohms mode, the ohms conversion circuit. And an illustration showing that in simplified form. Continues the theory of that. It still lacks something. I had to do a lot of head scratching when I was analyzing the IM-102, which is the same circuit as this, trying to understand exactly why they did what they did and how it worked. Uh, and so this does a better job of coming close to explaining it. The Heathkit manual probably made it worse than if they hadn't said anything. And then the uh, current range simplified diagram, the AC conversion, uh, the AC converter circuit simplified overview. Again, these don't seem to come in the order that you'd like them to be, but um, this is for measuring the AC volts, and then the power supply, then they get into maintenance, should 
In the course of normal operation, the Model 1240 should require no maintenance other than the occasional replacement of indicator lamps or overload protection fuses. Faulty operation may often be traced to improper settings of controls. A brief list of partial symptoms and suggested remedies is in order. And so they have some of that. Performance checks verifying it's in calibration. Several pages of that for the different functions. And then um, a very abbreviated calibration procedure covering the four basic adjustments which can be made from the rear panel. The adjustments inside the meter are ones that probably should only need to be set once at the factory unless some major repair work has been done. And then we get into additional schematics and exploded view diagrams which are actually pretty well drawn. They're just so darn tiny and they sometimes go off the pages a little bit. Um, um, main circuit board diagram, main analog section diagram, logic section diagram. This is really tiny. I blew this way up on my photocopier and I still couldn't read it. It just, you can't reproduce the text that small and have it be legible. I had to figure it all out by laborious and tedious probing of a circuit board. And then the power supply schematic. A uh, diagram for the uh, AC converter daughter board. Now one thing that Weston does here, which I'm not fond of, but I can see why they did it. Instead of putting component designators like C23 or you know R15 or something like that on here, they just put these other code numbers and you have to refer to the bill of materials to figure out what the actual component designation is. So that adds an extra step. On the other hand, it assures that everything has got a short, you know, two, three character maximum designator that'll fit better than some of the longer component designations. And then finally, the AC converter um, circuit board schematic. Several pages of parts list, again, showing the item number, which is only useful for comparing the circuit board layout drawings to this document. And then the actual component designations as used on the schematics are in the left column. Very brief uh, description, and then a Weston part number for everything. They have separate bill material for the main circuit board and for the daughter board. warranty and one page of um, well not errata it's just they're mentioning that they must have made a design change with uh, the meters in the 4000 serial number and above and those with 4000 or below 4000 had some different components Here's the uh, case from the other meter, the one that I stole the circuit board out of. And that had a serial number of 4811. So that this one here, even though it's in the wrong case, the guts of that are from serial number 4811. But the case is from this other one, which has a serial number of... Um, 9130, so quite a bit higher serial number. So this is the newer of the two circuit boards, and this area of the circuit board is different. They still have those four transistors, and they have a lot of the same components, but there's a lot more resistors down under here than there are in the earlier version. And then they uh, got rid of two diodes that would be up in that area, right in the middle of the picture. And they put this IC, I think it's an IC, with a round 8-pin package. Not too dissimilar to the packaging for these op-amps, except I don't think it's an op-amp. 
Not really sure what it is. It's a Fairchild part, same as the maker of all these gray ICs. The black ones are mostly Motorola's. Um, but it's something I've not been able to find any kind of a spec sheet for, data sheet, anything. I have no idea what it does. But apparently it performs a similar function, and that has to do with the uh, overrange indication. I'm not sure what functionality they got out of doing it this way instead of the other way. All right, let's talk about the schematic diagram and the circuit theory of the 1240. Now this is a redrawn schematic. It is not the original Weston schematic, and you've seen that in the overview of the manual. This is a recreated schematic that I created in CAD, and it's actually one page of three in a document that I have uh, generated, and it's available for download at the, uh, the web page that I'm going to show the URL of here. Uh, this is page one, and it shows the analog section. There's page two that shows the digital section and page three that shows the power supply and uh, semiconductor cross-references, timing chart recreated from the manual, and then there's an additional page, page four, that has general notes on the drawings, an abbreviated calibration procedure, specifications, basic circuit operations, so a little bit of circuit theory here, very abbreviated, some basic operating instructions where they differ or uh, need emphasis from what everybody would already know about multimeters, and then some additional notes. So that's all um, actually created originally for the Heathkit IM-102, which I did as a preliminary project, and then once I was able to get my hands on these uh, 1240s and build a representative example and uh, study it in detail. I used the original Weston drawings to the degree that I could see them and the work already done on the Heathkit IM-102 drawing set and then assembled from that this version for the 1240. Now I'm not going to go into as great a detail going into the weeds so to speak on this as I did on the IM-102 schematic. I took you know, at least an hour to go through that in considerable detail. I'm not going to repeat that. If you find that the overview I'm going to give here, the synopsis, is insufficient, look at my IM-102 video and look at the schematic breakdown. The schematics are 99.999% the same, except for component designations and tiny differences. Let's take a look at the schematic first. So we start out with the AC line, and uh, I'm going to move this a little closer under my light. You have your line cord coming in here, uh, 115 volts at 50 to 400 hertz. There's a Belden PH163 style plug on the end of the cable, and that matches the integrated socket which incorporates the fuse. These represent the plug connections from the case, electrical connections here for the socket, to the circuit board, three plug points. There's also this um, edge card connector on the rear for connecting the optional battery pack, or ba battery accessory as Weston calls it. And so this symbol appears several places showing where various points in this power supply circuit go out to that edge connector. Start out with one gang of the range switch where all points except off are tied together so this acts as the power switch. Then we have the selector switch that picks between 115 and 230 volts and wires up the two windings of the primary of the power transformer either in series or in parallel depending on which voltage is selected. The point is always to have about 115 volts across each of the coils. Um, then there are three 
secondary windings, two of them center tapped. Let's start out with the the uh, one for the bipolar power supply for the analog circuitry. So we have the outer two points on the winding going through a pair of diodes. This forms a full wave rectifier but not a full wave bridge. It only has the two diodes, it's not a bridge. And it works full wave because the center tap is connected to one point in the circuit and then the two diodes bring these two points together into the other side. So between here and here we have full wave rectification. Now there's a jumper on the circuit board that would be removed if the battery accessory is being used, in which case something goes off to the battery accessory then comes back. There's a filter capacitor. The load on this circuit is very low, so it's only a 250 microfarad capacitor. And these values can vary a little bit. Um, I've already observed in the three uh, 1240s that I've had personal experience with that the values aren't all exactly the same. But they're in the ballpark of 250 microfarads. There are these two transistors here that together act as a current limiter. What we basically have here is a classic Zener regulator or Zener reference circuit with one or more Zeners in series and then in series with that is a resistance element and the Zeners of course develop their own Zener voltage across them and whatever is remaining from the incoming power that voltage has to be dropped across this. Normally you would just have a simple resistor here but then that gets uh, dissipated as heat and it's more efficient to use a transistor active uh, limiter here uh, which changes its overall resistance as necessary to uh, drop the required voltage but it doesn't burn it up quite as inefficiently as a resistor does. So again I've talked about that in more detail in the IM102 circuit dissection. So then you develop a voltage across these two zeners. They're 12 volts each. You have 24 volts across them. And we're calling the plus side of that plus 12 and the minus side of that minus 12. And the reason that it's not 0 and 24 is because the point in between the two 12 volt zeners is connected to ground. So that establishes this is 0 volts. Therefore, this is only 12 volts above that. This is 12 volts below it. And there's also a, uh, a small electrolytic capacitor from the ground point to here. Now this is the part of the circuit that generates the plus 3.6 volts for the RTL logic. And RTL stands for Resistor Transistor Logic and it's an older form of digital logic that predates TTL. So you have another similar thing where you've got a center tapped winding. In this case the middle is grounded. You have a full wave rectifier using two diodes. Once again there's a jumper and two points to go out to the battery pack if there is one. A larger filter capacitor. This can be anywhere between about 1600 microfarads and 2000 microfarads depending on the example and then you've got a series pass element in the form of a Darlington transistor and it varies its resistance as required to establish 3.6 volts here under varying loads. It gets that without actual regulation because there's no feedback. It gets that by putting a reference voltage on the base of the first transistor in the Darlington and it gets that by taking the plus 12 volt reference, dividing it by a resistor voltage divider, one part of which is a potentiometer, and so you can get a varying voltage here by adjusting this, and that's applied here. And this gets tweaked at the factory until this is 3.6 volts. Here's the third part of the power supply. It's a single winding with one side of it's connected to circuit ground internally in the transformer coming out to ground on a single 
pin of the transformer so it doesn't have its own connection to ground here. Once again you have the option to run it out to the battery pack or bypass it. And here we have a Villard doubler circuit, classic circuit which again I'll go into considerable detail in the Heathkit IM102 circuit breakdown. But suffice it to say that this capacitor in this diode results in shifting the uh, AC waveform from the transformer up above ground and it gets almost all of it there but you do lose a little bit on the bottom. Here's zero volts and you have almost the whole sine wave clipped a little bit at the bottom and we take the peak voltage of this from ground and consider that to be the output but it is a pulsing circuit. There's no filtering or anything to smooth this out. It's a very pulsating type of uh, output and that's desirable in this situation. So we get a roughly 90 volt DC uh, that's an average value and it's pulsating. And that's used as the high voltage supply by the neon indicators and the Nixie tube display. There's also this additional uh, multi-tapped secondary winding. The IM102 does not have this and this provides various voltages for use by the battery pack accessory and they're just brought out to the edge connector. And finally there's another gang of the range switch which just gets passed out to the battery pack over the edge card connector and because it's jumpered together on every point except for off I'm assuming that the battery pack uses this as an additional power on off switch that it uses internally somehow. Alright, looking at the analog circuitry starting at the left we have the three jacks for the test leads, the one used for volts and ohms and way down here at the bottom we've got the one for milliamps and the COM. The COM is connected to circuit ground at the point where this Kelvin, connect, uh, Kelvin resistor is also connected to ground at this point. So it's not established anywhere else but at this one point right on the circuit board. Looking at the volts input there is no fusing for the volts input. It's brought into part of one gang of the range switch and if we're on the 2 volt or 200 millivolt range then that's just passing right through this current limiting resistor and into another part of a gang of the range switch also on the 2 volt or 200 millivolt range and then that's passed through and it goes straight over to the input of the analog to digital converter through a, a function switch contact that closes when we're in DC volts or ohms. So that's if you're in the 2 volt or 200 millivolt range and why is it that we don't have the switch making a distinction? Don't, aren't those different ranges? Well the reason is that this uh, analog to digital converter has two modes that it can be in where it's expecting two different input ranges. One of them is a 0 to 2 volt range and one is a 0 to 0 0.2 volt or 0 to 200 millivolt range. And I'll talk about that later but depending on uh, another gang of the range switch, the analog to digital converter shifts gears and is in either a 0 to 2 or a 0 to point 0.2 range. That's what it's expecting as full scale. So that's how come we don't have to make a distinction here in the circuit or for that matter here. Well when we're in other voltage ranges for example, the 20, 200, or 1000 volt ranges, which is all there are, 
after the ones we already talked about, then we do have to attenuate them before passing them on to the A to D converter. And that's where this precision resistor voltage divider module is. It's a hybrid circuit, or at least a potted circuit, so it all seems to be one component. It has a number of resistors inside, but for the purpose of voltage attenuation, we're treating them in, in chunks like this one, and then these two as one, this one, and then these two as one. So it's really acting as one, two, three, four resistors in series, and the bottom of it goes to circuit ground on any of the voltage ranges. So once again, a voltage divider between the volt ohm input jack and ground. And we tap off of it at only two points, this point here and this point here. So actually it's like these three resistors together treated as one, then this one, and then these two treated together. So we have two attenuated points here and here. This one is passed through in the case of the 1000 volt range to the 1000 volt position on this gang of the range switch, or this point here, uh, or this point here rather, for the 20 or 200 volt points. The result again being that we have divided the higher input voltage down to a lower voltage in the case of the 1000, it's got its own attenuation. In the case of the 20 and the 200, they're attenuated by the same amount, but again, that works because the uh, A to D converter is expecting either of two different ranges, and that corresponds to these two. So with this amount of attenuation, a, full, a 20 volt full scale input on this position of the switch results in a signal here of only 0 to 0.2 volts or 200 millivolts. On this position of the range switch, a full scale 200 volt input gets knocked down to 0 to 2 volts. That's again why the switch can be wired in this simple way. So that takes care of DC volts. What about the other DC thing we have? DC milliamps. So the external current comes in the milliamp jack, goes through a protection fuse, and then goes to this gang of the range switch, where we're divided out by uh, 200 microamps, 2 milliamps, 20 milliamps, 200 milliamps, and 1,000 milliamps, which is really electrically a 2,000 milliamp range, but the circuit is not rated for higher than one. Uh, 1,000 milliamps, just like the voltage circuit was not rated for higher than 1,000 volts, even though the circuitry treats it as if it's a 2,000 volt range. So here we use a series of resistors to form a current shunt. That incoming current comes through here, goes through the appropriate uh, contact on the range switch, and through one or more of these shunt resistors in series, and then coming back out to the common jack, so the simple current loop coming like that. And then of course some voltage is developed across whichever resistors are being used as the shunt, and that voltage is apparent between here and here. So we protect the circuit from excessive current by shorting it out essentially and that's done with a progressive diode limiter circuit here for both polarities. And again, I talk about this in more detail on the IM102 circuit uh, discussion. If you exceed the voltage that's the max allowed between here and here, these uh, diodes start conducting and essentially short the input out so that the current now goes through this path and doesn't go through this part of it, or at least not to the degree it would have if it hadn't been for this. And usually the intention is that then the current being shorted out can be high enough to blow this fuse, and then that keeps these from being damaged by applying too much current for too long. 
the voltage that's developed across the shunt let's say that we're only using these three resistors as the shunt so we're coming in and the current is going this way you get that voltage drop across this and then that voltage is read by passing it through the other two resistors which are minuscule in in their uh, resistance value and the circuit doesn't really know the difference between them and just a wire so um, you're essentially tapping off of whichever point is at the top of the shunt and reading it out here in the uh, current ranges or the current function more accurately it the meter does not do that gear shifting approach with the A to D converter it's always expecting a zero to point two volt uh, signal coming out of whatever the front end circuit is so this circuit reduces and converts the current being measured into a zero to point two volt voltage that then comes through here this resistor is just there for protection it doesn't really have a meaningful effect on the uh, the operation of the circuit and it only goes through this path if you're in the DC milliamp function the signal continues up here and it's presented to the input to the A to D converter just like the signal coming this way if you're measuring DC volts now I should mention at this point that the voltage can be either positive or negative coming through this way and the current here can be positive or negative it can be going in either this direction or in this direction which would result in a positive or negative voltage here the A to D converter is designed to work with positive and negative inputs it doesn't care which one they are and other circuitry later on can tell from how the A to D converter reacts to positive and negative voltages from that it can tell whether you have a positive or a negative input and therefore we can turn on an indicator letting the operator know whether it's a positive or negative input that we're measuring so now let's look at um, ohms measuring resistance the normal way to measure a resistance is to pass a current through the resistor under test and then measure the voltage drop across it and that's essentially what happens here although Weston put a refinement on it that I've not seen in any other multimeter of any kind that I've ever studied the circuit of so you could really start at any point in this circuit it's like a closed loop at which point we tap off the voltage um, we start out with a constant current source and that's done here with this Zener diode voltage reference and it's on the negative side so it's minus 12 volts off the analog power supply to ground and you end up with a voltage here and then that's applied to this transistor and when you've got a transistor with its base held constant at a constant voltage in other words it becomes a constant current regulator so we have a bit of a resistance here not a very high resistance and it's adjustable and this is what adjusts the current that it's going to regulate to and the idea is that it's set up to regulate to one milliamp through it and since the current's going in this direction it's treated like a uh, constant current sink it's trying to pull one milliamp out of this input of this op amp but as we know the input impedance is so high on an op amp that for all practical purposes there is no current coming in or out of an input therefore that must mean that if there's one milliamp going here it must be coming through here to get there and there's a 1k resistor here uh, Ohm's law tells us that means one volt so there's one volt here but it's not that simple because the plus input of the op amp is going somewhere and that might not be zero volts if this were held at zero volts then we would definitely have one volt out here but this is wired up like it can present an offset voltage so we would have the one volt here resulting from this activity plus or minus 
depending on whatever voltage is here. And we'll get back to that. That, we're just going to call it one volt at the moment, comes through here and it goes through on any resistance range of the range switch. And it can't go here because these contacts are only closed in the voltage uh, ranges. So the uh, current resulting from that one volt goes down here and it goes through any of these resistors in the uh, same attenuator circuit block that we used for uh, DC voltage attenuation. But in this case we're tapping off in between every resistor. So we have one or more resistors in series with this signal. It could just go through this one resistor and out this way. It could go through two resistors and go that way. It could go through all of these and then go out that way, just depending on the range. So we have a one volt source that's going through some resistor here, a fixed precision resistor, and then we go through a protection fuse which has some small amount of resistance, and then we go out the volt ohm jack through the resistor under test, back in the comm jack, and back to circuit ground. So that's the basic path. Obviously we're going to drop some voltage across whichever resistor or resistors are engaged here. We're going to drop some voltage, a tiny amount, but some voltage across this fuse and we're going to drop some voltage across the resistor under test before it makes its way back to ground. Well the voltage at the top of that resistor under test is tapped off here and it goes through this current limiting resistor and it goes through this part of the range switch for any of the resistance uh, ranges and we come straight in here and we've seen this before we go right into the analog to digital converter and in this case it is expecting to be in one range or the other and that's dictated by this circuit which we'll talk about so so far so good we've got a voltage here and it's resulting from the voltage dropped across the resistor under test and then it'll do its A to D thing and we'll read the value. But there's more to it. And that comes from this plus input here. So here's a simplified sketch of what actually happens. I'm going to circle back around to make this make a little more sense. We got one volt plus some sort of an offset voltage that passes through the resistor that's part of the range selector, then through the fuse, and then through the resistor under test, Rx. A voltage, Vrx, is developed across that resistor and that's applied to the plus input of the analog to digital converter which is an op amp. Because the op amp has some kind of negative feedback, it's going to operate its output such that both the plus and the minus inputs have the same voltage on them. Therefore, the voltage here is the same as VRX. It's not VRX, it's a different electrical signal but it's got the same voltage level as VRX. And then that's wrapped around and applied as an offset voltage to the op amp that's helping us generate our constant voltage here. So this is one volt from this plus VRX. Now we apply that here, we have this voltage divider again where we came into this discussion and that uh, VRX part we know is getting dropped here so what's left to be dropped from here to here is one volt and it's always one volt regardless of what the range switch resistor value is And the end result of why they did this and the cause of why they did it 
is as a way to dial out things like the resistance of the fuse and make this circuit more impervious to variables that could plague a simpler circuit. I won't go into all the weeds here. I talk about it in some more detail on the AM102 schematic discussion. But that's essentially how it's working. VRX does vary according to the resistor under test, and that is read by the A to D converter. It's just this other stuff here that's an enhancement that just makes it work better. What about AC signals? Well, let's take AC volts. We still come in through the positive test lead on the volt ohms jack. We come on down here. And in this case, even though it's still being applied to uh, this switch up here, just like on DC volts, and it's still doing this thing, and it's still doing this thing, the resulting voltage signal cannot get through to the analog to digital converter because this function switch contact is only closed in the DC volts or ohms position of the function switch. So we can't get to it through this way. We must take a different route. And this is the route. Now if we're in AC volts, we can come in this way from the test lead through this AC volts position of the function switch. And then we go into the daughter board, the AC converter daughter board that's within the dash lines. Since we're only measuring AC signals at this point, we want to strip out any DC component of the signal we're measuring. So we go through a series capacitor which blocks all DC components of the signal. We only have the AC portion. Now we do something very similar to what we did for DC volts, but it's a different part of the range switch. But it still operates the same way for 200 millivolts and 2 volts. Those are tied together and treated as a single point. Then 20, 200, and 1,000 are tied together and treated as a single point. Once again, there's a uh, resistor attenuator that's used if you're in 20, 200, or 1,000. Uh, 1, and if you're on the 0.2 volt or 2 volt, we bypass and go through this resistor here, very much like we did on the 200 millivolt or 2 volt range when we're doing DC, we just go through a series resistor for that, those two lowest ranges. And that's what's happening down here. Then we go to another gang of the range switch again. 200 millivolts and 2 volts come in this way and go through into the circuit. Those voltages are unmolested by this circuit. They just bypass. If we're in the two, uh, 2200 or 1000, we have this resistor attenuator. We tap off at two points just like we did with this resistor attenuator tapping off at two points in it and then going through to the 20 and uh, 200 and the 1000. We do exactly the same thing here. Tap off here for the 1000, tap off here for the 20 or 200. The difference here is that uh, each of the resistance sections has one or more capacitors in series or parallel with it and that is there to uh, tweak the resistance of this during different frequencies that are applied. Um, this can measure fairly high frequencies and at various frequencies you want to tweak the values of these resistors to get the most accuracy and that's what these capacitors do and this one is adjustable and this one is adjustable but otherwise we're doing the same kind of thing we did with DC volts. The result is either a 0 to 0.2 volt or a 0 to 2 volt signal here. Now it's not going to be that peak, that's an average value. We have to protect this circuit so there are clamping diodes going to plus 12 volt and minus 12 volt of the power supply. And then we go to a uh, source follower FET circuit, which is connected between plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts. The input to this circuit is very, very high impedance, and the output here is pretty low impedance.
This circuit needs to be high impedance so that we have minimal loading on these resistors here. And these resistor values can be pretty high, so we present a high impedance to whatever we're measuring. But this circuit here needs a low impedance, so that's what this does. It, it's a buffer that converts a high impedance circuit and its signal to a low impedance circuit and its signal. And this transistor just helps this one do its job. We have these two resistors in series, a 10K and a 90K, and this does some gear shifting. If we're in the 200 millivolt or the 20 volt range, we short out this resistor and then it's only this resistor. But if we're in the other ranges, 2, 200 or 1000, then we have both resistors in series. And this op amp here, its gain is determined by its feedback resistor and these resistors here. So depending on whether it adds up to 100K or whether it's only 10K, that's an order of magnitude difference and the gain of this is then changed from one to an order of, the mag order of magnitude difference. And that is again according to the range selected. Now there's this couple of extra contacts here which don't do anything. They're just the way the switch is wired up for convenience, but I show it here. So here we have an op amp with its positive input tied to circuit ground. So it's an inverting amplifier and it has resistive feedback and it's 10K over 10K if this one's shorted which means it's a gain of one but then you get a whole order of magnitude difference if it's 10K against 100K. We have another DC blocking capacitor and the signal is applied here. It's still an AC signal, a sine wave or whatever, ideally a sine wave because this is not a true RMS AC converter. It's an average reading uh, converter so it only gives you reliable readings if you're measuring a sinusoidal waveform. There is an additional, um, well a very simple resistive negative feedback element here which establishes a DC gain point and then we have uh, these extra capacitors here are just stabilizers for this op amp because these are old op amps and they needed these outboard stabilization components which modern op amps typically don't. We have another DC blocking element and then we have two diodes facing one direction or the other into equal value resistors. So the feedback path is if this is a positive signal out here at the moment, the positive side of the waveform, it takes this path for the negative feedback. If it's negative, then the path is this way through this diode. But since they're ideal, but since they're identical diodes and identical resistors, the signal passes through pretty much unmolested, except of course that you've got the, vi uh, the diode voltage drop that these diodes present. And that's always a problem with rectification, and that's why this circuit is set up the way it is, to cancel that out. Remember that the op amp, if it has negative feedback, is always trying to adjust its output in whichever way it needs to to result in equal voltages at the input. The plus input is tied to ground, that's zero volts, so the output's always doing what it needs to do to result in zero volts here. And because you're going to lose, you know, 0.6 volts or whatever these diodes have for their forward voltage drop, you need to have the output boosted by the same amount that these diodes drop the voltage in order to result in the same voltage back here as there is here. And that's going to cancel out the signal coming into here resulting in zero volts and that's compared to zero volts and the output adjusts accordingly. Uh, there's also a voltage divider here so what you really have is the output coming through a diode through one of these resistors and then through an adjustable resistor to ground. So that forms a voltage divider and it's actually the 
the output of that voltage divider that's applied back around this way, but it still works the same way. It just gives us an adjustability here. We're only interested in signals that are of a single polarity because this is, after all, a circuit that can only have DC voltages out here going into the analog to digital converter. So it's still AC at this point, but once it goes through the diodes, it's DC in one direction or DC in the other. We only tap off the side we're interested in, and then we go through a three-stage resistor capacitor filter, filtering it, filtering it some more, filtering it some more, to result in a nice steady DC voltage here, which is proportional to the average of the AC waveform that you're measuring. If we're only looking at one side, why do we need the other one? Well, that isn't strictly necessary. You could build this circuit with only the diode you're interested in, but if you have this diode reverse biased when the signal is the opposite polarity, it's like this isn't even here, therefore this feedback path doesn't exist. And you end up with uh, the gain of the circuit varying wildly, and it's not a very stable situation. It's much better if you can always give it the same kind of feedback under both polarities of operation, and that's why the other one's in there. So again, if we're in AC volts, according to the function switch, that resulting voltage comes out comes up here, goes into the analog to digital converter. What about AC milliamps? Well, it's the same thing. The front end circuit with the shunts works exactly the same way, but now instead of the resulting voltage drop coming around here and going right into the analog to digital converter, it's an AC voltage drop at this point, so we go through this AC milliamps position on the function switch and therefore we come into this circuit but the front end scaling has already been done here it doesn't need to have all this stuff that was used for scaling the AC volts but we still need to have the rectification part of it so we bypass all of this stuff that was used for uh, handling the AC volts and we come straight in through the back door, uh, more DC blocking capacitors, and we come directly into the input of the uh, precision rectifier circuit, and then the rest is the same. But this time we come out through this contact to get up to here. So now I've talked about all the pre-scaling for DC volts, DC milliamps, AC volts, AC milliamps, and ohms. Um, now we use a dual slope analog to digital converter here which is based around an op amp integrator so I'll look at that now all the signals come into this point here through one path or another there's a small filter capacitor to ground just for a little extra stability of the signal and then there's two transistors wired up as back-to-back uh, -back Zener diodes of approximately six and a half volts. So one conducts straight through and the other one acts as a 6.5 volt Zener diode. If the polarity is the opposite, then the one that was acting as a Zener just acts as a forward bias diode and the opposite transistor acts as a Zener. So it's clamping this to plus or minus 6.5 volts to protect the op amp. Here's the classic op-amp integrator circuit, or one of the couple of classic versions. There's a positive input and a negative input version. This is the positive input version. Uh, you come straight in with your signal that you're trying to measure into the plus input, and then you've got a gain setting resistor from the, the minus input or the inverting input to ground and then a capacitor from the output to the negative input or inverting input. And because there is negative feedback, the op amp will try to do whatever it has to with its output voltage to result in 
the voltage here being the same as what's here. So if you put 0.1 volts here, it's going to do what it has to here to result in 0.1 volts here. If you put in 1 volt here, it'll do the same thing to maintain 1 volt here. The voltage through this resistor to ground gives you a certain current, and because the current can't come from the minus input, it must be coming from the output through the capacitor. But we know that when we apply a voltage to a capacitor, it charges, and um, the charging is um, only linear if we control the the current, so or control the voltage dynamically, and that's what the the op amp integrator is doing by charging through the capacitor constantly to maintain the voltage here to match this voltage you result in the output ramping at a linear rate either ramping up or ramping down depending on the polarity of the signal and the the rate of the ramp depends on the input voltage so it'll ramp less for a lower voltage it'll ramp more for a high uh, a higher voltage and if we measure a certain amount of time like from here to here the ramp has reached a higher voltage for a higher input signal in that amount of time or it's reached a lower voltage in the same amount of time and if we count how um, the difference between here and here then we can and compare it to a voltage then we uh, a fixed voltage then we can determine what the input voltage was Again, I talk about that in much more detail. Uh, I could be here for half an hour going through this if I try to really describe it at this point, and I'm not going to repeat my previous efforts. So look at that other video if you don't know how this works. So there's a charge and a discharge part of this, and it operates in a cycle where it's charging up and then charging down and repeating. And every time it charges up and down, that's one sample. And the more often you can do a charge and discharge sample, the faster the meter can update its display to uh, reflect changes in the input signal. Sometimes you can ramp up and down at the same rate if you're just using the input to do that, but in this instance, this variety of the circuit, uh, we're only doing one of the ramps according to the input voltage, and then the other ramp is according to a fixed current that we're injecting. But going back to the basics here, this feedback capacitor is exactly this one here. And this resistor here isn't really part of the equation. It's only 100K, and it's not enough to, uh, compared to the impedance of this, to be something we need to worry about. It has a function in the circuit, but it doesn't change the math of the circuit. So we're just ignoring it for the, for the moment. We need to have this resistor from the inverting input to ground. How do we get that? Well, this whole elaborate thing here is what does that. We have this point, and again, ignoring this resistor, it's like the capacitor is tied to here. That point is brought over through some resistance, and it needs to go to ground or something that appears to be ground, and that's what this circuit is doing. In order to zero this out, to offset any small uh, positive or negative offset that may have crept into the circuit, either from other elements or from the op amp itself, and these older op amps had more of an issue with this than modern ones do. So we create a artificial ground here. We have plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts with a voltage divider with a zero adjust trim pod in the middle. The outer two resistors limit the span of this pot so it doesn't go all the way to plus 12 and all the way to minus 12 volts it's within uh, plus or minus 8 volt range that gives us a fair amount of offset and then through this resistor and this tiny little 10 ohm resistor to ground we still establish that small voltage from here to ground but with only a 10 ohm impedance so compared to the very high impedance of the op-amp circuit, this might as well be ground here. Except in this case, because it's an artificial ground, it might not be a zero volt ground. It might be, you know, 0.01 volts, positive or negative. 
whatever is necessary to zero out any intrinsic um, biases or offsets that are over here. But for the sake of this discussion, we can just say this is a zero volt signal which the op amp doesn't know isn't ground. And then from there we have this resistor and this resistor and this resistor in series and those are this. It's just being broken up into three resistors in series, one of which is adjustable for calibration and two of them can be shorted out by the DC milliamp switch or the DC volts or ohm switch in certain ranges with another gang of the range switch. So this is where the circuit here, this op amp has its range changed from 0 to 0.2 volts to 0 to 2 volts expected range. It depends on the function, it depends on the range. You either short these two resistors out or you don't, and when you short them out or not, that changes the range that the circuit is expecting. And you've got this additional ability to say what ground, what voltage ground is as far as this circuit is concerned. It only influences this circuit elsewhere ground is ground. And as I mentioned before, um, we're only using the input for integrating in one direction, either ramping up or ramping down. And to go in the other direction, we use an artificial constant current sink or source. And there are two nearly identical but mirror image circuits here. And again, I go into the weeds a lot more on the IM102 circuit, so you can watch that if you want to. But to suffice it to say, you either have a 400 microamp constant current going in here to this node, which again is this point, or you have a 400 microamp sink. And which one you have at a given moment depends on these two digital signals coming over here, which come from the logic part of the circuit. The analog output, which is a ramp up and down of this op amp, goes to the logic circuit. And there's also a comparator here with another op amp. The voltage here is divided in half by two 10K resistors in a resistor voltage divider with a small stabilizing capacitor. The op amp compares this point to zero. And the reason it's doing that is it has to know where we are in the cycle. So the op amp, for example, is ramping up. This is zero volts here. And then we tell it to ramp down. And when it gets down to zero volts again, we can't detect that it's at zero volts, but we can detect when it's crossed zero volts, even by a very tiny amount. So when the ramp comes down and it crosses the reference point on this comparator, again, even by a very tiny amount, then the output of the comparator flips to the opposite state. If it was low, it goes to high. If it was high, it goes to low. And by that measure, the logic circuit knows when the ramp has completed. It's gone up, it's come down. If the polarity is opposite, it's ramped down and come back up. When it reaches this and goes a minuscule amount past zero, it knows that this cycle is over. And it's time to do something and go the other direction. So, again, an analog signal and a digital signal going into the logic and two digital signals coming back from the logic to control these two constant current sources. I think it's useful to look at the timing diagram at this point. The ramp up, here's the ramp from the integrator, as it says output of integrator. It's always ramping down, ramping up, ramping down, ramping up. And it's doing that according to a timed cycle, which we're calling T. T starts here and ends here, and another interval T goes from here to here. The part where we're ramping up is called T1, and the part where we're ramping down is called T2. T1 plus T2 equals T, which is always 200 milliseconds. The logic circuit takes care of that part. So um, we apply an input which can be higher or lower to the uh, analog to digital converter and thus to the integrator. 
and again it can be um, depending on the range we've selected it's either uh, plus or minus 0 to 0 0.2 volts or plus or minus 0 to 2 volts we apply that to the integrator and based on how much voltage is applied the integrator goes up at a higher or lower rate and therefore when it gets to a certain period of time the end of T1 the logic says okay we've waited long enough um, then it disregards the input and forces those 400 microamp constant currents into it to force it to ramp back down and because the voltage reached here would be a higher or lower voltage depending on what the input voltage was then when we ramp down at a constant rate it takes more or less time for it to get from the voltage back down to here so if we ramped up slower from a, a smaller input voltage we only got to here and then we ramp down in the same amount of time or I'm sorry the same rate for according to the 400 microamps it takes more or less time to do that and if we came to a higher voltage it takes more or less time to do that we count the time it takes to go from one to the other and that is what we display all right here's the um, the logic circuit and as I mentioned before all the logic in here uh, is either done with transistors or with RTL logic chips uh, RTL is resistor transistor logic it's just built using simple transistors and resistors so very simple internal architecture inside the chip RTL is kinda slow and very power hungry it's very power inefficient I should say it uses a lot more power to operate than uh, later logic families TTL was better CMOS was way better and so on um, but RTL has the advantage of being fairly simple to fabricate and it was kind of cutting edge at the time you know the 1960s that it was developed in as a matter of fact the logic circuits in the Apollo spacecraft guidance computers and probably some other places were using RTL logic ICs really the first logic ICs were this type although they were using custom ones for Apollo and the ones we're dealing with here were made by Motorola or Fairchild but they're the same vintage and same kind of technology so there's no way I can describe all the nuances of this circuit in um, in a reasonable amount of time and it would be hard for people to understand it anyway without lots of diagrams and things so I'm going to treat it more of a block diagram arrangement uh, here are the signals coming to and from the analog circuit there's four of them this is the analog signal coming from the output of the integrator IC and this is the signal coming from the op amp comparator which is detected as zero crossing going one way or the other and these are the two signals here and here that are coming from the logic going back to the analog circuit to determine which of the two constant current sources should be operating and when they should be operating this circuit down here uses a couple of RC time constants an inverter and a, a logic gate to determine which way the signal is going and when it's happening and from there we generate a couple of signals here and a signal here this signal here is just the logical inverse of this signal so when this one's high this one's low and vice versa and this one's tied directly to the output of the comparator so this is really the comparator output and this is the inverse of the, the comparator output and this one is essentially detecting when a crossing has taken place and it goes over into this block of logic something has to keep track of whether we're in the T1 part of the cycle or the T2 part of the cycle and that's this logic here and this is really what's commanding 
the rest of the logic what to do. We generate several signals off of this because it's getting this signal and it's comparing it with these signals here coming in from the rest of the logic and it generates one, two, three signals that are used by the rest of the logic. This one directly off of this flip-flop comes right back here is combined in logic with the output of the comparator and the inverted output of the comparator and that's what's generating these two signals to control the constant current sources. We also have an oscillator. It's just uh, two inverters with uh, capacitive feedback crossing over from one to the other and then with some additional components to make it more stable and to make it adjustable. This one trim capacitor is tweaked to get exactly uh, 40 kilohertz and it's a square wave and it can be turned on and off according to this signal through this diode. It can be squelched if you will. If you're not squelching it then it free runs and it generates a 40 kilohertz signal. If you squelch it with this logic signal then it stops generating the 40 kilohertz signal and that's the master clock. What do we do with that clock? We come out of here, we come into one, two, three ICs that are each decade counters. So they count up to 10 and then reset. This one counts up to 10 and resets. Every time it resets, it pulses the next one, which counts 10 of those things and then resets. When it resets, it sends a pulse to the next one, which counts up to 10 and resets and then it, again its carry output continues on. In that way we essentially have a three decade counter. This one is counting units, this one's counting tens, and this one counts hundreds, sort of like a flipped backwards odometer. But we're not done yet, that's just three digits and this is a three and a half digit multimeter. So its maximum count is 1,999. The 999 part is handled when all of these are full up and ready to reset. And when they do reset, we take the output, we invert it, and we go into a flip-flop. Um, the flip-flop is wired up as a divide by two counter. So these were essentially acting as divide by tens and this one's acting as divide by 2. So when you overflow this, you count up to 999, overflow it, this one flips to a 0 to a 1, that puts a 1 in the thousands position, and then these start out over again, counting back up to 999 again, and that plus the 1 in the thousands position gives you 1999. And then the result of that sets another flip-flop which is also a divide by two and that goes in another flip-flop that's a divide by two. These two outputs are combined logically and when they're combined logically that's saying that the logic is detected that a count of 8,000 has been reached. It's the 8,000 detect. If you take 8,000 and mathematically combine it with 40 kilohertz you end up with a 200 millisecond uh, period of a cycle of measurement that we talked about earlier. And so that's fed back around and it comes into this circuit which influences the flip-flop that decides if it's time to flip from one state to the other and depending on which state it's in we're either ramping up or ramping down with the integrator and that's fed back as already discussed. A couple of more signals are derived, as already mentioned. One of them influences the storage elements for the display, and the other signal controls the 1,000th position and the overrange storage control. Because these, this circuit, because this circuit's always rapidly counting up to a total count of 8,000 and resetting, and only 1,999 of that 8,000 is used for measurement. The rest is for housekeeping other parts of the cycle 
in other words the opposite ramp um, we're only actually counting for display purposes a small part of the overall time cycle and uh, what do you do with the display the rest of the time you can't just have it flickering so we have to go into a storage element and that's what's happening here each of these counters at the moment of flipping over here when it detects we've reached the end of the cycle we have to take a snapshot of what the counters have in them at that moment so this signal here wraps around and it controls one two three storage registers so they take whatever the counters have then in them at that moment and store that number it's stored as a four digit BCD number for each digit and likewise it's important to capture what's in these guys at that same instant and that's what the other signal coming out of here does it wraps around into these two flip-flops one of which captures the current state of the uh, flip-flop that determines if we've got a thousand position on or off that's stored and one that stores the over range which would be if it gets up to this point then that's stored in this one so this flip-flop is a storage element just like these were over here but for only a single bit and that's the bit saying if we've reached the thousands position or not and this one stores whether we've reached the over range now this flip-flop works a little differently and it's controlled it's set and reset by these two signals here which again are coming from the comparator and the inverted comparator so depending on this and when it transitions in other words where is the zero crossing detected and when was the zero crossing detected in the overall time cycle that will decide whether this output of this flip-flop is on or this one's on these two are used to operate the plus and minus indicators for polarity this flip-flop determines whether or not we should light up the one position display element for the thousands and this flip-flops output decides whether or not we should turn on the over range indicator and so in that sense it's very direct we essentially have one two three four five six counting elements in a row and then we have some storage registers that are just like these storage registers functionally speaking and you have that snapshot everything is captured at the moment of zero crossing and stored until the time we do another cycle and can update everything I've already talked about how these flip-flops influence the four indicators up here but we have the Nixie tubes for the ones tens and hundreds so the Nixie tubes are up here we take the stored BCD value from these storage registers and feed it into the decoder drivers which convert the BCD value into a 1 of 10 output and they're open collector transistors in here arranged for a fairly high voltage signal designed to operate Nixie tubes that are running at you know around 100 volts or so so even though it's a low voltage logic chip it can have higher voltages applied to these pins only one at a time of these is turned on and they directly drive the 10 different cathodes of the tube and only one of them is on so only one cathode can be lit up and which one is lit up determines whether it shows 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or 9 and the anode gets its power directly from the high voltage supply which is again about 90 volt DC average but is in reality a pulsing DC signal and that's uh, put through a current limiting resistor which determines brightness to some degree each Nixie tube has its own resistor for that purpose just like each of the neon bulbs has its own current limiting resistor except in this case where only one of these two plus and minus can be on at a given time they share a current limiting resistor okay a few more nuances about the indicators um, I'm going to go back to the Nixies 
they have decimal points located at the lower right hand uh, I'm sorry the lower left hand corner of the Nixies so if I look at the neon bulb that gives me a one and then the three Nixies that can give me 999 it's pointless to have a decimal point here but we might want a decimal point here here or here depending on what range we're in so each Nixie actually has two decimal points with another one here here's another Nixie it has a decimal point here and the other Nixie it has a decimal point there at its lower right hand corner but we're only using the lower left hand corner decimal points and those are wired directly from the tubes bypassing all of the ICs into another gang of the range switch which determines based on which range we're in where the decimal point should be and only one of those decimal points is given a path to ground through a current limiting resistor thereby turning on that decimal point so that's how that's done and then uh, for the neon bulbs you get the digital logic signals coming out and they go through resistors into uh, NPN transistors which are ones that are rated for a high enough voltage they can be tied to something that's connected to you know 90 volts or thereabouts and whichever one gives a path to ground is the one that would light up we only want these two indicators to come on when we're in the DC volts or almost position or the DC milliamps in other words measuring something that isn't AC so there's two additional contacts on the function switch that condition the operation of these the Heathkit IM102 goes a step further they do the same exact thing but they also put in series with this one they put another gang of the range switch so it can tell whether you're in DC volts or ohms at the moment and only if you're in DC volts does it allow this switch contact to make so it's like another switch here therefore on the Weston 1240 if you're in ohms you'll get a rate, uh, polarity indication even though it's not applicable but on the Heathkit version they've made an enhancement that only if you're in DC volts or DC milliamps do you get a plus or minus indication not when you're in the ohms range I'm kind of surprised Weston didn't do the same thing here a nearly identical circuit for the one for the thousands position except there's no switches to condition there's nothing needed in the way of additional conditioning the circuit for the over range is very similar except we have an additional resistor here and these two additional transistors which look conspicuously like the two transistors we had wired up as zener diodes in another point in the circuit and that's what they're doing here as well this point in the circuit if I get rid of my diagram is coming directly from the output of the analog to digital converters integrator so what this is looking for is an additional means to detect an overrange normally the logic here can determine we've got an overrange because we will count too high during the T1 phase and that'll be detected by logic and used to turn on this uh, flip-flop here and there for the overrange indicator but under certain conditions that's not a reliable way and it can miss an overrange if we're doing it that way so there's this little back door approach where if just the simple uh, ramp of the integrator gets too high or here's zero or it ramps down and it gets too far in the negative direction that's another way of detecting an overrange so uh, it's more of a brute force thing but if that integrator signal gets high enough to forward bias one of these virtual Zener diodes then it conducts through and you've got a couple different paths if it's positive 
it makes the base of this transistor a higher voltage than the, emi uh, than the emitter to ground, therefore it turns the transistor on, even if it isn't being turned on by this IC. Conversely, if you've got a, a much higher negative voltage or a larger negative voltage than you should have from the integrator, it does the same thing in reverse, but now it's pulling instead of pushing current. So now we've taken the emitter and dragged it down to a negative voltage, therefore assuring that regardless of what's going on up here, the emitter is lower than the base, and therefore it turns on the transistor. So one way we get it by making the base higher than the emitter, the other polarity we do it by making the emitter lower than the base. One or the other gets changed by this circuit in a way that the transistor turns on and thereby the over range indicator is turned on. But normally it should be getting that through this path from the digital logic and not from the brute force backdoor method. This circuit represents the earlier um, 1240s. There was a change, I think it was around serial number 4000 thereabouts, just based on empirical evidence and some detective work I've done. I don't know if they thought this didn't work well enough or if they were trying to introduce similar functionality but with some additional bells and whistles. They did away with, well they still have the transistor, but they did away with pretty much this whole thing and put in a little 8-pin IC, which I've not been able to determine what it does or what its pin out is or anything. And I've tried to reverse engineer it and not been successful. But the resulting functionality is you still have the backdoor method for indicating the overrange, but it, I think it maybe does something in addition to that. More than just you can accomplish with two transistors, two diodes, and an extra resistor. I'm not sure if it flashes it faster or something. There is an RC component uh, wired into this extra IC. So I'm guessing it may have a timing function, sort of like a 555 timer. Maybe they make the overrange even more urgent or something. Maybe they cause it to flash faster. Beats me. I don't know what they're doing, but um, the result is that they have an enhanced way of accomplishing this on later serial number versions. But since I can't show a schematic for it without knowing the functionality of that chip, it's really kind of pointless to put it in here. So I'm showing the original version, and this is the version that was copied by Heathkit for their IM-102. So, um, to really try to complete my Weston 1240 restoration, it's sort of a, a coda to what I've already shown, and this is in progress at the time I'm making this video. Um, I've reached out to a local metal fabricator and made some sketches and based on photos and other things that I can glean from online sources as well as just measuring the cases of the two 1240s I have I figured out the approximate size of the two handles that are also used as a stand for the 1240 and sketch those up ignore the red marks, those were me thinking out loud and I should have used pencil instead of pen. Um, and then a sort of a top view of the two handles nested and uh, a rough sketch of the uh, hand nuts for the handle. And uh, this is what I gave to my fabricator to see if he would do it in the first place. And I have this uh, proper engineering sketch here which uh, closer to scale, it's about half scale, um, showing all the parts, defining them, giving their dimensions properly, and uh, talking about the material to be used and the finishing and the quantity, and then similarly the details on making the hand nuts using an off-the-shelf part from Ace Hardware, actually one of the Hillman parts, and then putting some quarter 20 threaded rod into it, um, cut to length, and then I bought a 3 16 inch um, Allen wrench, 
which is the size necessary to operate the uh, or to fit into the 1240s fuse holders uh, to unscrew them and uh, he's going to cut sections off of that and then weld them onto the end of the threaded rod so it'll be a close approximation of the original Weston uh, hand nut. And uh, he estimated about two weeks before he gets around to doing this. I also should mention that I'm including the original Weston little slot on the inner handle which gets used as a prying point putting a screwdriver through that slot it aligns with the notch on the bezel to help pry the bezel uh, off when you have to take the meter apart.